الحمد لله نحمد سبحانه ونستعينه ونستغفره ونستهدي ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهد الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن سيدنا ومولانا وعظيمنا وزعيمنا وحبيبنا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم قد بلغ الرسالة وأدى الأمانة ونصح الأمة وكشف الغمة وجاهد في سبيل دينه حتى أتاه اليقين فاللهم اجزه عنا وعن والدينا وعن الإسلام والمسلمين خير ما جازيت به نبيا عن قومه ورسولا عن أمته اللهم أحينا على سنته وأمتنا على ملته واحشرنا تحت لوائه وأوردنا حوضه واسقنا من يده الشريفة شربة هنيئة لا نضمأ بعدها أبدا اللهم آمين Again we are going to continue to tackle the issue of good manners with Allah and today's subtopic is about trusting Allah trusting Allah to give your full trust to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala our trust of Allah if it is going to be based on logic and common sense there is a lot of evidence to bear that not trusting Allah is a betrayal of yourself your submission to Allah and even of your goals in your life when we trust each other for something we don't speak from two sides of our mouth we don't say I trust you but I really don't trust you but when we deal with Allah we say Iyaka na'bud وَإِيَّاكَ نَسْتَعِينَ And we only do one. We want his help when we need it, but we don't want to worship him when he requires us to. That is one level of betrayal. The other level of betrayal is when we say إِيَّاكَ نَسْتَعِينَ But we come with questioning of his qada and qadr. That means we don't trust him. We hear and read in the story of Prophet Yusuf السلام, how he was taken from his father by a trick and how he was taken as a young boy and thrown in a well and left to die and then he was picked by a caravan that sold him for a cheap price and those who bought him from Egypt the king or the prime minister, whoever that was, took care of him in his own palace and his wife was very uh, kind to this young boy and he grew up in her house and then she became both his blessing and his following test. Then through his test, not agreeing to play her game and refusing to violate his ethics Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saved him from falling to her temptation that was his third test so the first test is he was thrown in a well to be left to die Allah saved him he was sold to turn into a slave and a servant Allah made him empowered and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala just to draw our attention that bad things can lead to the best things you could ever have he says Yusuf," and in this way we have empowered Yusuf in this way meaning through his trials and tests even as a young boy through the trial and the test of his father who himself is a prophet through their trials comes their triumph so Allah is telling us it is through your difficulty that you may get what you aspire to have it is not despite your trial 
So life doesn't give you all what you want, all at once, or all at the same time, or all when you need it or want it. Allah will give you what He designates for you. But if you are sincere to Him, if you trust Him with your life, with your position, with your hopes, with your fears, with your worries, with your family, with your monies, with your everything, Allah certainly promises to deliver you. وعلى الله فليتوكل المتوكلون on Allah and on Allah only those who have any trust should deliver and keep their trust in Him alone in Allah alone وعلى الله فليتوكل المؤمنون if you are true believer only trust Allah don't say and you are looking for uh, someone else to do the job. You trust Allah with something, leave it up to Him. And trust whatever He does, whether you like it or you don't. And don't you ever judge Allah's actions with your limited measures, knowledge and experience. Because you are too limited to establish a criteria. Again, I'm going to repeat this. Don't you ever judge Allah with your limited knowledge and experience. Because your knowledge and your experience combine with the knowledge of all of humanity and the wisdom of the elders of all of humanity, they mean nothing to the knowledge and the wisdom of Allah. So when you trust Allah, never put His actions or his choices for you, his qada or his qadr to your measures. And that's why in the hadith, the Prophet says, Yustajabu lil mar'i ma lam yasta'ajil. The prayer of the person will always be answered so long as he does not hasten the answer of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Don't say, they ask the Prophet, what do you mean by astajil? What do you mean by hastening the response of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? He says, يَقُولُ دَعَوْتُ فَلَمْ يُجَبْ لِي Many of us do say this, unfortunately. They say, دَعَوْتُ, I prayed, but Allah never answered me. That means you don't qualify for His answer altogether. When you make dua, the Prophet says, when you pray and ask Allah for something, trust Him to deliver. Don't question whether He has delivered or not. But you have to know how Allah delivers on your prayer. Sometimes He gives you exactly what you ask for. Does it happen to us? It does from time to time. Right? And when He gives what you ask for, it doesn't necessarily mean that this is good or bad. He's just giving you what you ask for. If you are trusting to Allah, what He gives you always is going to be in your best interest. It's going to help you, one way or another, whether you see it or not. Sometimes He doesn't give you exactly what you want, but He gives you something better than what you want. Even though you didn't get the boy you want, you didn't get the girl that you want, uh, or anything else, but he may bless whatever he gives you. And that's greater than giving you the gender you want, but not the blessing you need. So sometimes we ask Allah with our limited knowledge and wisdom, with limited vision and limited look into the future, for something tangible, immediate, instantaneous, because we are pressing from inside. Our souls, our self is pressing. I want this, I want this. I am married for 10 years. I need a boy. All of them are girls. I need just one boy and I'm ready to die. All of, this is not some people who don't pray say this. It is us Muslims. So you have to be careful. 
So when Allah gives you something different, don't become desperate. If you accept it and are grateful for what you get, you get different blessings with it. Number one, Allah blesses what He gives you. Number two, you never get hurt but what you got, by what you got. So sometimes you ask for a boy, you have five, six girls, you are feeling the pressure, the family, everybody is saying he doesn't get boys, so means he's not a man, right? If you allow yourself to be subject to that pressure and you ask for a boy, a boy, a boy, maybe the boy is going to be the test of your life. And I've seen cases like this, it's a boy or girl, whatever. So we need to be careful that when we ask Allah, that we are not desperate, but we are trusting. And the difference between being trusting and being desperate is, when you are desperate, you're never satisfied with whatever you get. Sometimes Allah gives us what we ask for incrementally. You get it in due time. You want some money. You want to be able to pay your bills and give your family a better life. Allah is not going to make you a millionaire overnight. Okay? He doesn't allow you to buy the lottery or do anything uh, like that or play gambling or anything. So Allah will increase you incrementally. Sometimes in ways that you don't feel that Allah is upgrading your life because it's coming incrementally and we are impatient. So when we turn desperate, that desperation disqualifies the trust that we have of, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and it deprives us from getting the full blessing of what He has. Sometimes Allah doesn't give you any of what you ask for in that dua or that time, not now, not ever, and not what you need, not anything different, but He keeps it for you on the Day of Judgment. You will have one dua, one dua, and He will give it to you then, it will mean the world for you. That is the next word. When you ask Allah, Oh Allah, forgive me. When you meet Allah and you look at your book and you say, God, I submit. When you say, I was wrong. So we have to be careful not to hasten the response of Allah. يُجَابُ لِلْمَرْءِ مَا لَمْ يستعجل. Your prayer will be answered provided that you are not going to say, Allah didn't answer my prayer. We look at lives of prophets as examples for us to follow. How much and how far did they trust Allah with everything? The example that comes to my head now is that of Prophet Musa. Pharaoh and his army are running after Musa and his people. Musa is running towards the Red Sea. Pharaoh is running after them. The chariots, the horsemen, the spears, the swords, they are really running to catch with them. Pharaoh's people look back as they get close to the sea and they are suddenly shocked. Where are we going to go? Pharaoh is behind, the sea is here, what's going to happen? So they look at Musa as they always did and they say, Inna lamudrakun. We are caught. We are caught. We're done. Look at Musa's response. Kalla, nay. Inna ma'iya rabbi sayahdeen. I have my Lord with me. He is going to guide me. Look at the level of trust. You're faced with your own death and the demise of your entire community that trusted you to follow you. And you are really helpless. You can't help yourself, let alone helping anybody else. But your level of trust never wavered. Never wavered. Never forgot whom he is talking to. Never forgot whom he has spoken with before. Never forgot that he faced Pharaoh, Pharaoh, this big tyrant 
that nobody raised their head to speak to him face to face. Everybody talking to Pharaoh was bowing to the floor. But Musa stood up, Allah delivered him. So we need to ask ourselves, could we really trust Allah in a moment like this? Could we really trust Allah? And Allah told him, Musa, hit the sea with your stick. The same stick that he defeated Pharaoh with is the same stick he is going to kill Pharaoh with. Fanfalaqa, the sea split into two huge mountains of water. And Moses, his community, started running, not believing their eyes, but they were running. They were just running with Moses. And as soon as they were out on the other side and Pharaoh caught up, he also thought that this is gonna be also his path. So he goes after them, running with the army, the chariots, the leaders, everybody, hoping to catch Musa and his followers. And what happens next is history, we all know it. They were all drowned. And Pharaoh, at his moment of death, he submits to Allah just a few minutes late. Just a few minutes late when he said, آمَنْتُ أَنَّهُ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا الَّذِي آمَنَتْ بِهِ بَنُوا إِسْرَائِيلِ وَأَنَا مِنَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ I am a Muslim, I submit, and I believe there is no God, not me, not anyone else, except the God of Musa and the children of Israel. Amazing admission. Allah answers him, that was too late. Al-Ana. Sometimes we submit, but after the fact. That submission doesn't help much. It's called in the Quran, useless faith. We spoke about this several times. It doesn't hurt to repeat it. Did Pharaoh benefit from his submission? Did he benefit? from admitting and submitting to Allah and saying, I am a believer, O oh Allah, I believe there is no God but you. That is the shahada. So Pharaoh made the shahada, but he was what? He was drowning. He was floating, drowning, underwater. That doesn't help. يَوْمَ يَأْتِي بَعْضُ آيَاتِ رَبِّكَ لَا يَنْفَعُ نَفْسًا إِيمَانُهَا لم تكن آمنت من قبل أو كسبت في إيمانها خيرا. So two types of people, their faith will help them when the قيامة comes or when they die. Only two types of people. One who just entered the faith even a minute before. He discovered truth. He accepted Islam and he planned and intended and committed to live by Islam, but Allah put him to death. That man is saved. Even if it is one minute or two minutes, that man is saved. Amanat min qabl, which means before the day of judgment and or before their death. The second person, which what I want to focus with you on, aw kasabat. في إيمانها خيرا. Someone who has earned righteousness, righteous deeds after they became Muslims. I will explain this because I know it's not very clear. But if you look linguistically, it's very clear. The Quran is saying, unless you earn something good, in your faith, which means after you believe, your faith becomes useless. So a Muslim who says, I am a Muslim at heart, in my head, every ounce in my body is a Muslim, but I don't pray. Did he earn anything good in his faith? No, he didn't. The Muslim who prays, 
but he hurts people and he slanders, he steals from people, he cheats. Did he earn goodness in his faith? Partially, yes. And then it's up to Allah. It's up to Allah. But he cannot claim anything on Allah. Because Allah says, Inna salata, prayer that you're doing, tanha. Through prayer prohibits us from doing anything vice, anything evil, anything bad. This is what prayer does. If it doesn't, then what happens? Where did our prayer go? So we have to focus on earning what is good, what is righteous, after we admit and submit to Allah. It is not enough to say, I submit, I am a Muslim, but I will not do this. I am a Muslim, but I'm not going to dress the hijab that Allah mandated for women. I'm going to dress whatever, jeans, whatever, call it whatever you call it, but I'm not going to dress this hijab because it's backward and the society wouldn't accept me, uh, they will mock me, I will not get a job, I'm not going to keep a job. All of this runs against the grain of trusting Allah with your faith and your fate. To trust Allah that when you act as a faithful person, Allah is going to be with you. Allah is going to support you. Allah is going to open to you doors that you don't know about. Many of us men do not unfortunately want their wives to dress hijab because the environment is not hijab friendly. But so long as we hide from our own faith, how and when would this environment turn around and accept us? If we're hiding, they will keep you in the closet. You want to call it closet Muslims? Yeah, we have many of them who don't want to show their faith on their face because they are afraid they don't trust Allah to protect them. What about the people of the Ukhdud, those Muslims who were tried in their faith by the king of Najran and he gathered them all in one place and he ordered his soldiers to dig the ditches and fill it with oil and lit it on fire and push them trying to tell them you either leave your faith and join us worship the king or else your life is at stake and the hadith says that a woman was carrying a baby and she was being pushed and she was going with the flow she was not resisting. But then when she came close to the fire, <coughs> holding her baby, she felt mother. It's kind of like a shock. How could I do this? So she started to hesitate and thought to retreat. As she was thinking, her baby, an infant, spoke to her and said, Oh my mom, follow through, follow through, you are on the truth path, you are on the straight path. And the mother went on trusting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with her fate. The stories are many. But if you take facts of your own life, you will find similar but not exactly the same situations repeating in your life. Show me your hand if you've never faced a crisis in your life. You've never felt cornered. You've never felt helpless. Show me a hand if any of us 
has not ever felt cornered, pressured in a crisis. Almost everybody goes through a crisis or more in our life. Then the following question is, ask yourself, didn't Allah pick you up? Didn't Allah give you cure after sickness? Give you wealth after poverty? Gave you health after you were unable to do anything on your own? Did he not, even if you have not gone through any crisis, did he not pick you from the womb of your mother? Utter helplessness, utter weakness. Then he turned you into a powerful person, man or woman. He gave you everything. Who picked you up other than him? Does Allah need to prove himself to us, to trust him? If this is what you feel, that means you have to check your heart. Do you understand who Allah is? Do you recognize what Allah did for you? You personally, no prophets, no examples, no history stories, just your own life. How much and how many times did Allah pick you up? Who gave you the wealth you have, the house you live in, the car you have, and the job you're holding, and the skills you use, and the brain that works, and the legs and the hands that take you where you want? Who? It's Him. So He gave you before you have ever been able to even think, let alone ask, let alone be grateful. As a child, by the time you're 10 years old, Allah has already blessed you with so many things. If you try to count those only, you could never count it. You could never count it. Even the body that we walk with is a good reason to trust Allah with everything else. Look at how your cells work, how your skin rejuvenates itself. How your liver does the same, how your pancreas does the same, how your heart is working automatically. No machine, no maintenance, no gears, nothing. Allah is working you out even when you are asleep. You go to sleep and Allah doesn't because he's taking care of you. So does Allah need to prove himself to us? Some say, I don't feel that Allah is with me. My husband divorced me. He left me with five kids. And he even didn't do the papers. And he left overseas. I feel I'm dying. I'm desperate. Where is Allah? And I always turn the question back. Before you ask, where is Allah from you? Ask, where are you from Allah? Why do you wait until you are cornered to remember him? How much have you done to get closer to him? And when you did, did he flee away from you? Or did he stand to support you? The hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu ومن جاءني يمشي أتيته هرولة What an amazing God, subhanallah. He who tries to come closer to me one inch, I come to him one yard. And he who comes to me walking, I come to him running. This is Allah. He embraces you before you even embrace him. Even if the person is not a Muslim. Doesn't Allah provide for the Muslim and the non-Muslim, those who believe, those who reject, those who are vulgar, those who are polite, those who are nice, those who are not? Everything is in his hands. It doesn't decrease a bit when he gives. It doesn't increase a bit when he holds. But he gives with wisdom and knowledge, and he holds back with wisdom and knowledge. 
The matter is a matter of respecting Allah's qada and qadr. To respect His will and to respect His choice for you. Not to challenge His choices. Not to question His knowledge. Not to question His wisdom. Not to question His presence with you. But the opposite should be true. We should always question if we are close enough to Allah or if there is ever a point when it is enough to be close to Allah. If you want to embrace Allah, is there a distance that could be enough? The answer is no. You have to keep coming. Keep coming with your good nature. Keep coming with your righteous deeds. Keep coming with your clean hand, with your clean tongue, with your open heart, with your forgiving nature. Keep coming to Allah and Allah will never turn you back. وَإِذْ قَالَ رَبُّكُمْ وَقَالَ رَبُّكُمْ ادْعُونِي أَسْتَجِبْ لَكُمْ Pray to me and I will respond to your prayer. I will answer your prayer. This is Allah. Do we know any other God that would come close, would do anything for us? Then if we don't trust Allah fully, completely, and permanently, and settle that account of our relationship with Allah, whom are we relying on then, other than Allah? The Quran asks this question. Who would protect you? Who would provide for you? Who would take care of you when you go to sleep at night or when you go roam the earth seeking to provide for yourself and your family? Who's taking care of you? The Quran asks. So brothers and sisters, the primary question between us and Allah is never to question Allah, but to question where we are from Allah. We tend to ask, Mata Nasrullah. But we don't tend to ask, do we qualify for the Nasr of Allah? We tend to ask Allah, do you see those thousands upon thousands and tens of thousands of poor people, helpless Muslims, young and old children being burned in Burma and being killed in Syria and there and there and there? And we don't ask ourselves, have we offered them anything? What is our role? Some of us think that the mere fact that we pray and ask Him is all what we could do. But Allah turns the ball back to us. He says, you have to do your part. Prepare whatever means of power you can. Then, if you consume all your means, if you've done all your effort, you have put all your resources, look up, and he's going to be ahead of your prayer, supporting your effort. Ahead of your prayer, because he's faster than our prayer. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us and help us to trust him fully and permanently. Allahumma ameen. الحمد لله وكفى والصلاة والسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وأشهد أن سيدنا مولانا محمدا عبده ورسوله اللهم صل وسلم وبارك عليه وعلى صحابته ومن اتبع سنته بإحسان إلى يوم الدين وعنا معهم بفضلك يا أرحم الراحمين Those who trust Allah they need to know what evidence should they provide for their trust of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, As-salatu nur, prayer is light, which means it is your torch in the darkness of life. 
your prayer should act in that capacity. It should show you what is right and distinguish it from what is wrong. And it should give you the inspiration to want to do what is right and the power to do what is right without hesitation. That is prayer. وَالصَّدَقَةُ burhan, And charity is a proof. Charity is a proof. What does charity prove? It proves our trust of Allah. That you trust Allah more than you trust what you have in your bank or your pocket. Because this is the only way anyone would spend money. Money you earned, it is in your bank, it is in your pocket. Would you give it without a return? No wise person does this. But a believer who trusts Allah when he says, وَمَا أَنْفَقْتُمْ مِنْ شَيْءٍ فَهُوَ يُخْلِفُهُ وَهُوَ خَيْرُ الرَّازِقِينَ A believer who believes Allah. When Allah says, whatever you spent, meaning in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which means according to his guidance, Allah will replenish it for you. And he is the best of providers. The believer who trusts that statement, that position, then that believer is going to spend and he doesn't care. We know the stories when the Prophet ﷺ was asking the companions to come up with some money. And Abu Bakr brought all of his money. Umar brought half of his money. And Uthman brought, everybody brought something. So the Prophet ﷺ turns to Umar, Umar, what did you leave for your family? He said, I left them half. So I brought half and I left them half. Quite calculating, but very good compared to what we have. Then he turns to Abu Bakr and says, Abu Bakr, what did you leave for your family? He said, I left them Allah and his messenger. Very short, very brief answer. These two levels of trust are very close to each other. But when you go to people who even have more and don't give as much, then there is a question. There is a question. The more you want to keep, the less trust you have in Allah. That's a sign. The more you want to keep for your family, the less you have of trust for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because He is the one who provided you initially with all what you had. You were, what? Penniless, poor, had nothing. Allah provided for you. Ya ayyuhal nas, antum al fuqara'u ila Allah. Wallahu huwa al ghaniyu al hamid. O people, you are the poor ones. When, when compared to Allah, you are very poor, you're penniless, you have nothing. You need Him and He doesn't need you. Antum al fuqara'u ila Allah. You are in need of Allah. And Allah needs none. Huwa al ghaniyu al hamid. If He wills, he would take you out and he would bring a whole new creation. And this is not much for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's not difficult. It doesn't take him any effort. It's be, it's go and be. That's it. So brothers, as a matter of good manners with Allah, we need to work our level of trust of Allah to the highest level. And the best way is to keep giving without asking Allah because He automatically replenishes you. He automatically will do it for you. You don't have to ask. Keep giving. I have heard stories from you, some of you, our community here, who told me, tell it to the community so that they may trust Allah. I'm not going to swear, take it or leave it. One brother told me that he gave a hundred dollar and he goes to his job and the accountant 
tells him, we owe you $100 from last month. He says, no, you don't owe me anything. I took my check full. So they review back and forth. No, he got the check full. But then the accountant told him, but there are hours you work that were not calculated for you. And those hours came down to $100. That was exactly the following day. So he took the $100, and next time we asked for donation, he gave $1,000. And believe it or not, he got a promotion and a raise for $500 a month. Now those are how much? $6,000 a year? Right? So he said, I have to keep giving something every month. Other stories run in the same vein. People who give always get back something, either uh, in kind or cash. This brother got it cash. Another brother said, I had leukemia for three years. And my last visit, the doctor said, you're gone. You have few days or few months, God knows. <coughs> so a brother told him about the hadith, Dawu mardakum bis sadaqah. Give treatment of your patient ones through charity. So he said, I decided to get all my savings and put it in the box out here. The doctor had told me, I don't need to visit him anymore because there is nothing really he can offer. He said, but I trusted Allah. Listen to this. I trusted Allah and I kept giving and I kept asking Allah to accept my giving. I never asked him for cure or relief or anything after what I heard from the doctor, even though I trusted him, but I, I was waiting for his delivery. Then the three months went by, the six months went by, the two years went by, and he decided to go to the doctor to see what, how he's doing. So he goes to the doctor, and the doctor asks him, where did you go for treatment? And he said one word, I went to Allah. I went to Allah with all what I have, and Allah seems to give me all what I used to have. These are people who live with us. And if you want, I can call them out. Brothers and sisters, our trust of Allah is the key to our salvation in this life and in the hereafter. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the maximum trust of his knowledge, his wisdom, his qada, and his qadr. Allahumma hadina fi man hadayt, wa aafina fi man aafayt, wa tawallana fi man tawallayt, wa qina wa asrif anna sharra ma qadayt, اللهم اقسم لنا من خشيتك ما تحول به بيننا وبين معصيتك ومن طاعتك ما تبلغنا به جنتك ومن اليقين ما تهون به علينا مصائب الدنيا ومتعنا اللهم بأسماعنا وأبصارنا وقوتنا ما أحييتنا واجعله الوارث منا واجعل ثأرنا على من ظلمنا ولا تجعل مصيبتنا في ديننا ولا تجعل الدنيا أكبر همنا ولا مبلغ علمنا ولا إلى النار مصيرنا وإذا أردت بقومنا فتنة فنجنا منها يا مولانا غير خزايا ولا مفتونين ولا مبدلين ولا مغيرين اللهم لا تدع لنا في يومنا هذا ذنبا إلا غفرته ولا دينا إلا قضيته ولا هما إلا فرجته ولا كربا إلا نفسته ولا مريضا إلا شفيته ولا ميتا إلا رحمته ولا دينا إلا قضيته ولا ضالا إلا هديته ولا مبتلا إلا عافيته ولا سائلا إلا أعطيته ولا مذنبا إلا رحمته اللهم اغفر لنا ولإخوان المسلمين اللهم انصر الإسلام وعز المسلمين وأعلي بفضلك يا رب كلمة الحق والدين أقول قولي هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم فستذكرون ما أقول لكم وأفوض أمري إلى الله إن الله بصير بالعباد وأقم الصلاة